Welcome to SpaceX in the News, the place to go for all your SpaceX intel. My name's Kevin, and today we're gonna start things off checking on Starhopper to see exactly how much longer we have to wait to see its final flight. We'll then discuss Elon's recent visit to both Starships and all that has happened concerning them over the last week. We'll debrief SpaceX's Amos 17 mission that launched a few days ago and the exciting event that occurred because of it. We'll get into an interesting development concerning SpaceX's drone ship, look at some upcoming missions, and then finish things off with today's honorable mention. Let's get started. So Starhopper was scheduled to make its second flight, a hop up to an altitude of 200 meters, on Monday the 12th. However, just a couple days ago, all but one road closure near the launch site in Boca Chica was canceled, with only the ninth remaining closed for a wet dress rehearsal, which is when propellant is loaded into the tanks but not ignited to make sure everything is nerminal with the launch vehicle. But if you were to call the local hotline, you would learn that there are in fact future dates of road closures still scheduled. The 19th being the primary and the following two being contingency days. Elon confirmed on Twitter that these delays were not caused by Starhopper, but by the approvals needed with the FAA. SpaceX was apparently cleared to hop to 20 meters, but needed to file additional paperwork for 200. More good news is that we space nuts may get to experience some HD audio of the Raptor engines igniting thanks to Reagan Beck. Hi Reagan. But what some may consider to be sad news, Starhopper may be forced into retirement after this next hop. Quoting Chris on NASA's space flight, I'm told it's getting out there in public conversations, so from our end, where we can cite our own info as secondary, what is being heard is that Hopper is set to be retired after the 200 meter hop. As a result, it won't be moved back from the LZ. It'll be cannibalized for parts as the pad will be prepared for Starship Mark 1. And that's where it gets really exciting. Hoppy will likely become a grasshopper style display, but there's no confirmed plan on that part. This is what I was hinting at in my thumbnail for episode 37. Elon did visit Boca Chica to check out his Mark 1 Starship in the construction yard and took some photos of the second bulkhead to be placed inside the vehicle. He did say progress is accelerating and that certainly seems evident. You can see from Boca Chica Maria's photo here that the bottom half of Starship isn't getting any smaller. In fact, parts for a giant crane were spotted on site this week and just a day or two later the crane's assembly was completed and already put to good use by placing yet another hull section on top of the already monstrous structure. Just imagine for a minute how beastly this spaceship is going to look when these two halves are stacked one on top of the other. And after his visit to Boca Chica, Texas, Elon then headed to Cocoa, Florida to visit the Mark II Starship. Curiously, at the site you can see what appears to be that new assembly building, but notice that it doesn't have a huge hangar bay door for a big rocket to move in and out of. It does have a smaller door, but uh, good luck with that. Let me know your hypothesis to the question, what's up with that down in the comments. But Elon does seem to be pleased with the work the Starship Cape team has done these last few months. Tweeting, although they started several months behind, they are catching up fast. This will be a super fun race to orbit, moon, and Mars. So apparently he has no plans to declare a loser until after we get to Mars? Well, it is good to know that we may have two Starship sites to capture our imaginations for the foreseeable future. Elon further tweeted that orbital success by both teams in close proximity would be amazing and each would count as a win. My own educated guess as to why Elon visited both these Starship sites is to prepare for his upcoming presentation, which is officially going to be on the 24th, where he will do a detailed review of the first orbital Starship, explaining the pros and cons of each design decision. He'll be giving it in Boca Chica, and by that time, the Mark I Starship should be almost ready to fly with three Raptors. So I think we can start expecting a suborbital Starship flight as early as next month. Aren't you thankful for living at a time like this? Moving on, this week SpaceX launched Amos 17 to geostationary orbit above the African continent. The satellite successfully deployed, but unfortunately the booster took an intended one-way trip to Earth's big puddle. However, Go Miss Tree did accomplish its second fairing catch in a row out in the middle of the Atlantic. I read somewhere that although it only takes eight minutes from liftoff for a booster to land, it takes a fairing about 45 minutes to reach a net. That's quite the spread. And what makes it even more impressive is that what essentially is some autonomous robots can navigate these moving pieces into place on the high seas, at the edge of space, in the middle of the night to make such a catch. If you're not impressed, then you're depressed. Or maybe just not paying attention. Speaking of drone ships, here's some interesting news. On August 1st, SpaceX's drone ship, just read the instructions, left the west coast and is currently making its way toward the Panama Canal. It's expected to reach the canal on August 15th, and it seems its final destination will be either Boca Chica or the Cape. There's currently no info available as to why the drone ship is following and go Miss Treek's wake, so to speak. 
But with that being said, just read the instructions is probably making the trip because there's no scheduled launches on the West Coast for the near future. And furthermore, SpaceX is ramping up on the East Coast with Starlink and Starship that could require an additional landing platform. So do you remember that SpaceX EPA filing that we briefly went over last week? Well, in it, SpaceX revealed their plans to ultimately support as many as 70 annual Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches by 2024. Elon responded to this Tesla Audi article on the matter, writing wouldn't read too much into this, likely to be fewer Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy flights, but possibly an order of magnitude more than these numbers in Starship flights. Tesla Audi did quote the filing that SpaceX plans to increase the Falcon launch frequency to 20 launches per year from LC-39A and up to 50 launches per year from LC-40. However, as Starship Super Heavy launches gradually increase to 24 launches per year, the number of launches of the Falcon would decrease. SpaceX also just announced their intentions to expand their launch services to directly address the needs of small satellite operators through regularly scheduled dedicated Falcon 9 rideshare missions. Ridesharing is just when several smaller satellite companies pull their money together so they can afford one rocket that can take all their satellites up into space. It's a way to share costs. We'll get further into this in a minute. But looking at future flights, SpaceX now does show Starlink missions two and three scheduled for October and November, although I can't confirm these dates, so take them with a grain of salt. And of course, we should be seeing the in-flight abort test of Crew Dragon in a couple months. The two NASA astronauts that will be the first to fly in the capsule were photographed conducting suit up and leak checks using the same ground support equipment hardware that they will use for their launch to the ISS. Pad 39A, from which they will send from the Earth also underwent emergency evacuation tests in preparation for the Demo-2 mission. This mission was delayed after the first flight-proven Crew Dragon capsule suffered a catastrophic anomaly during testing in the spring. It will probably launch early next year. Now it's time for today's honorable mention. So we briefly discussed SpaceX's intention to infiltrate the small sat market. That move will create competition for another space company, Rocket Lab, an American and New Zealand rocket developer located in New Zealand that specializes in ride-sharing missions. After SpaceX made their announcement, Peter Beck, Rocket Lab CEO, put on a presentation where he announced Rocket Lab's intentions to infiltrate booster reusability, something that he had said in the past would never be possible for his smaller rockets. We, we're not doing a propulsive uh, re-entry, and obviously you saw we're not, we're not doing a propulsive landing. And the fundamental reason for that is that that takes a small launch vehicle and turns it into a medium-sized launch vehicle. And we're not in the business of building medium-sized launch vehicles, we're in the business of building small launch vehicles for our dedicated customers to get on orbit frequently. During his presentation, Beck shared animation of what booster recovery for his Electron rockets would entail. Basically, it involves allowing the booster to re-enter the atmosphere without the protection of retropulsive thrust or steering ability that grid fins would provide, then deploying a type of spherical drogue chute before popping the main followed by a helicopter that would intercept the gliding booster by hooking onto a main line before proceeding to a recovery ship for its final transport back to the coast. So why did Beck change his position on booster recovery? Well, to quote this Ars Technica article by Eric Berger, Beck said, at the end of last year, I started to really look into the possibility of recovery and the team looked at the data. We formed a recovery team and started hiring early this year and they've been working on it ever since then. And every flight we've been instrumenting more and more understanding more and more. In parallel with that, we've been building computational fluid dynamics models and structural analysis models and really validating those models with our data to understand what's going on. As we understood the problems better and better, we got to the point where we were able to propose solutions that we felt were really quite feasible. At that point, we committed to the project and started upgrades. You'll see on flight 10 a few obvious changes on the first stage of Electron, and we felt this was a good opportunity to talk about it, given that the jig will be up soon with people starting to notice stuff. We'd be busted pretty quick. Andy's probably right. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. A very special thank you to my Patreon members who make these episodes possible. If you would like to show your support and perhaps purchase a zero-g indicator, then check out the links in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and until the next one, Godspeed.